Hello and welcome to The Sharpening. I'm your host, Josh Peck. Tonight is our 30th episode. It's amazing that uh, 30 weeks have passed by already since The Sharpening first started broadcasting. Uh, we've covered a lot of topics. Uh, we've had a lot of guests, even some who have been willing to record back-to-back -back episodes, such as uh, Jim Wilhelmson and um, Doug Woodward. Uh, but there is still one milestone that we, have, we haven't yet crossed, that is, until now. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to announce that tonight we have for you the Sharpening's very first returning guest, Dr. Ken Johnson. Uh, for those of you who have been with us long enough, you'll remember episode 9 when Ken Johnson was uh, on the first time to talk about his fascinating research into the Gnostic Gospels. For those of you who missed it, the episode is archived on my blog talk radio page as well as my YouTube channel if you want to listen. Uh, the title of that one is The Sharpening 009, Dr. Ken Johnson and the Truth About the Gnostic Gospels. And, of course, I highly recommend listening. <laughs> uh, since that time, uh, since the time that episode aired, we've, uh, we've gained a lot of new listeners and new fans of the show. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'll go through uh, Ken Johnson's introduction again. Dr. Ken Johnson is the CEO and founder of Bible Facts Ministries. He studied church history and biblical Hebrew at, Christian, at the Christian College of Texas and received a Ph.D. He is the author of numerous books, including De Demonic Gospels, The Truth About the Gnostic Gospels, which we talked about last time on the show, and many others covering a wide variety of topics. Uh, he has done extensive research into Bible prophecy, both fulfilled prophecy as well as prophecy that is yet future, which will be the topic of tonight's show. It is my honor to welcome back to the show Dr. Ken Johnson. Ken, how have you been doing uh, since we last had you on? Well, thanks for having me back. Uh, uh, we've been doing very well. Lots of ministry opportunities, uh, lots of people being helped, a few new books. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I, I can't get enough of your research. <laughs> uh, it's 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 extensive, but it's uh, it's also easy to digest, which people like me appreciate. <laughs> so, all right. So the last time uh, last time you were on, we went through your testimony, so I won't make you repeat all of that again. But um, since we'll be talking about pri Bible prophecy in this episode, which is a topic I'm passionate about as well. Uh, I do want to ask, what draws you to study fulfilled and end-time Bible prophecy, and is it important for Christians to study? Uh, I think so. I, the main reason I'm interested in it is because I would like to actually know ahead of time and look and watch prophecy being fulfilled. I think it's very important for us to be able to point to that uh, to witness. We've got all these different cults, uh, all these different religions, all having their own holy book. Uh, but none of them have Bible prophecy fulfilled in our lifetime. And when you can point to things that are supposed to have happened, that prophets talked about thousands of years ago, and people say, oh, I remember that. I was there. My dad was in World War II, so he remembers a lot of things that happened, had no idea they were Bible prophecy. So it's, it's very important for witnessing. Oh, wow. Wow, well, that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, yeah, the something that you know what fascinates me about it is is that uh, we can see Bible prophecy, as you said, be fulfilled in our our own li lifetime. And um, you know, growing up, I never really realized that there wasn't as much emphasis on Bible prophecy in my upbringing. But I, uh, it was something that always at least interested me. It interested me, and now that uh, now that I've been studying it more and more. Um, it's it's mind blowing <laughs> how many things have been fulfilled in even I mean even the past hundred years it's 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 mm -hmm. insane um, the the study of Bible prophecy can be pretty challenging though at times uh, for example being able to tell the difference in uh, prophecies concerning the return to Israel uh, for those who want to get into studying Bible prophecy what what kind of advice would you give that could make sorting things like that out a bit easier. Uh, well, I did write a book, Ancient Prophecies Revealed. It takes 500 prophecies and puts them in chronological order. Uh, one of the main reasons I put that together that way is uh, advice that I was, was given to me actually by the church fathers. And when you go through and you look at a prophecy out of the minor prophets or the major prophets, and they say something about Israel will return and when it does, this, this, and this will happen. Uh, you look real careful and see if that's returning from the north country, from 
uh, Babylon, in which case the prophecies that are associated with it are going to be back in 536 BC. On the other hand, if it says that Israel is returning from all countries or the second time or anything like that, you know that the prophecies that are about to happen uh, associated with that passage come sometime after 1948 AD, the second return. And so that's very important when you begin to compartmentalize each one of the prophecies and the groups of them, and you can tell what happened when, and it makes it a lot easier. Oh, good deal. Um, yeah, I, I know that uh, one of the mistakes I've made early on, um, one, one of the first things that I would really look for everywhere was the rapture in, in the Bible, and I would look at... Uh, prophecies that had nothing to do with that and expect to find it in there and, and was uh, a bit disappointed to find that it wasn't there. But um, so I, I like that idea of compartmentalizing the, the prophecies so you can get a clear picture of what's going on. Um, well, I think, uh, I think probably a really good place to start talking about some of the fulfilled um, prophecies would be to talk about Jesus. Uh, most of us probably have a general idea of some of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, but what might not be as well known are some of the more really specific prophecies that foretell things even to the very day. Uh, could you tell us about some of the more specific prophecies that Jesus fulfilled? Yeah, there were uh, several. When you go back and, and just looking at at the prophecies in general. Just three or four of them ought to be enough for you to focus on something that's happened in your lifetime. Uh, Isaiah tells us that the name of the Messiah would be Salvation or Yeshua. Uh, Balaam back in Numbers tells us a star would appear at his birth. Uh, Daniel in chapter 9 tells us that the Messiah would come and die for the sins of the people before the destruction of the second temple, which was in 70 AD. And it actually tells you from the date of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, so many days forward would be when the Messiah is cut off. And if you got those things out and calculated them, you would know the exact year. Knowing that he was a priest, or was to act as a priest, he would have been born at least 30 years before. So you can kind of put those things together, be looking, and then when the star appears, it should be pretty obvious because... Within eight days, according to the Mosaic Law, there would be two people bringing in a baby from Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, excuse me, from Bethlehem that would want to circumcise their son, and they're going to call him Yeshua. So you know that, and as soon as you see that, it's pretty obvious who's there. And that's why Simeon, you know, lifted him up and said, my eyes have seen your salvation. Just to know all that ahead of time and see that happening is amazing. One of the things that most people don't realize is that uh, one of the prophecies uh, mentioned in, most of the prophecies mentioned in Matthew uh, deal with things about the Messiah, but Matthew's just simply pulling some of the major things that are easy to understand, and there's so many of them that we get the idea through Matthew that obviously Jesus was the Messiah. But he gives you half of the prophecies most of the time. One prophecy is that uh, the child, before he learns good and evil, uh, the two nations that are bothering Judah at the time, which is Samaria and Syria, will be no more. And what's interesting about it is, is in the wars between Partha, Parthia, which would be Iraq or um, Persia at the time, decimated Syria and actually cut it in half, and it ceased to exist about 30 B.C. And then with the reign of Archelaus taking over from Herod, uh, when he went crazy and killed several hundred priests, the Romans said that's enough of religion. Didn't replace him, just simply obliterated Samaria and said it's now Roman territory. That happened at 10 AD, which is about two years before Jesus went in and had his bar mitzvah. And so there's a whole lot of these things that you look at, and if you realize that, yeah, within a couple of years before he actually did the ceremony to become an adult, to know good from evil, those two countries ceased to exist. And there's a whole lot of prophecies like that in there. He fulfilled the first coming, probably uh, at least 150, depending on how you count. Some people count it as high as two to 300 prophecies. Uh, just amazing. Wow. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. It's, uh, it's kind of mind-boggling how um, that uh, there can still be a lot of skeptics out there that will you know, try, to, um, try to deny that stuff. Um, 
there, there are, there's probably a few out there who might speculate against this point, but I, I believe that the vast majority of us uh, would recognize uh, 1948 as a very important year concerning fulfilled prophecy, and mm. it never ceases to amazes me, amaze me just how specific these prophecies can get, just like with um, the prophecies of, uh, that Jesus fulfilled. Uh, can you tell us about some of the Bible prophecies that were uh, fulfilled in, in 1948? Yeah, in 1948, I believe there were 10 or 20 of them specifically. Uh, everybody knows that Israel is supposed to come back, and Israel did. Uh, I was preaching uh, at a church uh, yesterday, actually, yesterday morning, and someone came in, and they were talking to somebody that is neo-Nazi, British Israelite, something like that, trying to say that uh, maybe the Jews that are over there now aren't really the real Jews, you know, this kind of a thing. It comes up every so often. And I was telling him, it's like, but the prophecies are specific. The Jews, that would be the real ones, are supposed to come into their land, reestablish it, and there's actually even a date given, much like the first coming of the Messiah. So whoever went into that land over there, ancient land of Canaan, and established a Jewish state on that date would have to be the real Jews because they fulfill prophecy. So it, it's pretty straightforward, and it wasn't the church, so the church hasn't replaced Israel. You know, it, it should be really easy to understand. But uh, it's not just that Israel came back. There was, there was many, many prophecies. Since 1948, we've had over 50 prophecies fulfilled. Uh, just some of them are, of course, Israel was supposed to come back. They're supposed to come back as one nation, not two, not Israel and Judah. Uh, they're supposed to name the country Israel. I would have guessed Judah, you know, for Jews rather than Israel, but no, it was supposed to be Israel. Uh, the symbol of David, the shield of David, was supposed to be on their banner. And, of course, we have the Star of David on the Israeli flag. They were supposed to bring back the Hebrew language, the Lip of Canaan, according to the prophecy. And, of course, they speak Hebrew over there now. Um, uh, it just goes on and on. They redo the cities. They were supposed to start originally in the southern part of Judah without Israel, or without Jerusalem, rather, as a capital, for a specific reason, Zephaniah mentions. And, of course, that took place. Uh, the evil land of Moab was supposed to be greedy for land and capture land uh, at that point. And, of course, Moab, Edom, and Ammon were prophesied in Daniel to come together and form a country in the end times, and that's Jordan. And, of course, Jordan did come in and capture. That's why we have a West Bank, uh, which, which is causing all the problems today. Um, and it just goes on and on. Uh, all sorts of things like that were supposed to happen. Uh, when they came back, instead of kings, they were supposed to be some sort of elected officials, uh, according to the Micah prophecy. And it is. They have uh, prime ministers now. They don't have kings that rule. Um, and it just goes on and on. They're supposed to be one of the probably the most fierce fighting force on the planet. And yet at the same time, they have pockets of people in their borders that don't like them, which doesn't make sense. You'd think. Why don't they get rid of them? Well, it must be politics. But again, it's it's everybody knows Israeli quality uh, weapons and, and these kind of things, and you don't mess with Israelis. The only people Israelis might be scared of would be China, Russia, or the United States for the sheer amount of people and technology. Uh, but again, we see all these things happening with uh, the things that are going on with the Lord, and it's just amazing. Wow. Yeah, I remember... Um, <clears throat> When I really started uh, looking into prophecy, you know, my my at first my passion was really just an end time prophecy, and I'd look into that. But when I started looking at stuff that had been fulfilled like that, and realizing how specific it was, wow! <laughs> I mean, like you said, to the even to the very day that y you can actually trace that back, and it's it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Even uh, e even due to even with how specific these things can be, I mean, I I've even heard a lot of speculate. I think I think probably one of the most I don't want to be mean, but maybe one of the most ignorant things that I've um, heard. I was trying to witness to somebody, and I was telling them about fulfilled Bible prophecy because I think that's a that's a really great way to, you know, witness. Um, and I, I was telling about 1948 and some of the prophecies that were fulfilled. And then he said um, something along the lines of, "Well, it seems like that would have happened eventually anyway." It's like, oh. <laughs> So I, th I think some people are just kind of in that willingly um, ignorant mentality because there there are things you know there might be some things that maybe could be 
you know, worked out that way, but you can't control everything. And, you know, I'm sure that in studying these things and writing about them, going out, speaking about them, everything like that, you, you must have received more than your fair share of skepticism as well uh, for those who would try to prove these things wrong. What, what are some things that people will try to say to refute fulfilled prophecies, and how, how do you respond? Yeah, I've had the same kind of thing. I've talked to, to Muslim friends that I used to work with, and they would say similar things like, well, the United States made that happen. Okay, even if that's true, do you think the United States is more powerful than Allah? Oh, well, no. Well, then Allah allowed it. Well, yeah, so it must be the will of Allah. No, no. Well, what else would it be? <laughs> you know, just think about these things. Okay, the United States made it happen. Uh, it's the same thing. I had one guy tell me that, well, one of the prophecies is that when Israel comes back, they would be founded by a guy named after King David. Uh, and it was David Ben Gurion. He was he fulfilled like three or four of those prophecies. And someone said, "Well, you know, he's a Russian Jew. Who knows? Maybe his name was Yachov something, you know. And then when he migrated to Israel, he changed his name to David. And it's like, okay, even if and it wasn't. He was born David. But even if that was true, just think about it. You think I could change my name to David and run over to Israel and become prime minister just because of that?" <laughs> I mean, think about it for a minute, you know, and it's not just one prophecy like that. We've got like 10 to 20 in 1948, and in the last 60 years, 50. Uh, there's just too many of them to be a coincidence. I think the United States is pretty powerful, but I don't think they're that powerful. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree. It's, there's just too much, the, the volume and the specifics. And, you know, a lot of times skeptics, too, will point to that some of the – They'll point to the ones that are more vague than others and say, see, they're all, they're all vague. Well, no, there's some really specific ones, too, and there's other prophecies that even go into uh, further detail about other prophecies and kind of help uh, put more specifics on the whole thing. So it's it's when it's looked at as a whole like that, it's, it's a, impossible for somebody with unbiasedly, I should say, or with a rational mind to really be able to uh, refute it or, or stay a skeptic. Um, so you, you mentioned that there have been, uh, there have been a lot of, um, prophecies. Well, let's go back. Uh, yeah, so, something, uh, something that I, I found really interesting and I, I've heard you talk about before, um, is, uh, how the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is prophesied in the Bible. And, and there's, there's an amazing story behind that. Uh, could you tell us how that was fulfilled? Yeah, that's out of, uh, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 29, but it says that uh, Israel would be basically at war, fighting, and the old ones, the prophets, would speak out of the dust of the earth. You know, when you first read that passage, it's like ghosts coming up out of the out of the backyard or something. Um, but what was interesting about it is, is that this Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and they were in the hands of Palestinians or, or Arabs. And uh, Israel was, was beginning to negotiate to try to get a hold of these things. The first and the biggest was the Isaiah scroll, which is now um, housed in Israel. And they had finally scraped together enough money to go get this thing. And Israel Yarden was the, the guy that had got the whole deal together, went and got the money, left the university, went down, and actually purchased the Isaiah scroll turned around and was going to bring it back to the university and found out he couldn't get there. Apparently a war had started and he had to take it somewhere safe. And so it's it's an amazing story. He tells a little bit about that type of thing. But again, Isaiah and the prophets begin to speak out of the dust of the earth. We have their writings. Now there's almost no difference between the Isaiah scroll found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and what we have. Uh, the Ezekiel tablets, the originals written on black basalt tablets, three words difference between it and what we have in our Bible. Um, but again, it, it's just an amazing find. It verifies, because a lot of the Muslims that I've talked with have said, well, you know, it's probably been tampered with. Well, the Old Testament goes all the way back to uh, B.C. time, you know, which would be 600 years before Muhammad, you know, and they say it's been tampered with. They need to find one of these other kind of Bibles that exist, and we've got so many things going all the way back talking about that. And it's just amazing. Most people don't realize there's actually quite a few prophecies about uh, Hamas and um, uh, Islam for the last days. And again, you have to look careful at the prophecies and see, but uh, there's there's quite a bit in there for that. 
Oh wow! I definitely want to talk about that. What are what are some of the prophecies? Because I I think I might have found at least one. But um, <laughs> what what are some of the ones that uh that you've been able to turn up with that? Oh well, again, uh, the church fathers say again, if you if you're seeing in the in a certain time, the Lord will bring back the remnant of Israel, and you look and see if it says the second time or all over or whatever. Uh, and in Isaiah chapters, uh, I think, 11 and 12, it actually says, Isaiah says, when the Lord brings them back the second time. That has to be 1948. Uh, they were created uh, as a state after they left Egypt, went into the Promised Land, and, and basically created Israel. And then they were ousted by Nebuchadnezzar for the 70-year captivity, came back, of course, with Cyrus in 536, and then ousted by the... Uh, Romans for 1816 years until 1948. But it talks about the fact that um, when the Lord brings them back a second time, there will be a peculiar religion amongst the people that surrounds Israel. Now, way back when, uh, there used to be tons of different kinds of pagan religions. But again, this is the second time. So in 1948, the nations that surround Israel, which of course would be uh, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, Persia, which is Iran, uh, Egypt, all these places are Muslim. So we're talking about the Muslim religion. And it goes on to say that uh, basically tell me history if you can, tell me prophecy if you can to see whether you are truly of God. And of course you can look at the Palestinians now, they don't even think there was a Solomon's Temple on the Temple Mount. Everybody knows their words, too, too well documented. Every historian, even atheistic ones, will tell you, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed a Jewish temple on that spot in, in 606 B.C. You know, and this is when it happens. It's 606 when it started and then 587 when it was finished. But everybody knows this, and it's with, within a year or two, except, for, of course, for Palestinians that don't know history. And there's no prophecy in the Quran. And it says that the work of that group, which is the Quran, amounts to nothing. And whosoever chooses that as a religion is an abomination to the God of Jacob. And it's just an amazing prophecy again. So Islam is obviously false. Uh, it obviously is a, a, a religion of, of hate and murder. But, you know, actually mentioned in scripture like that. The other thing that was interesting, going a little step further in not just that, but uh, in, in Psalm chapter 20, it talks about how at a certain point in history the Lord will send help from the sanctuary to teach the people uh, the scriptures and to reinstitute the sacrifices. Well, that's fine, and we, we read that and we totally miss over it. The word for help in Hebrew is Ezra. So if you transliterate that instead of translating it, you actually have the Lord will send Ezra to the people to teach them the scriptures and to reinstitute the temple sacrifices. And that's exactly what happened. We even have a book in the Bible called the Book of Help or the Book of Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so you have to look real careful at those things. There is a word in Hebrew for violence, which is all through the Old Testament scriptures. And usually 99% of the time it always means just violence. Uh, but the word for violence in Hebrew is Hamas. And there are three specific scriptures that talk about how in the end times, slightly before the time when the day of the Lord would come, there would be uh, Hamas, or a violence, that would raise itself up to be a seat of wickedness. The seat of this group would be in Kalna, Goth, and, and a few other places, which I thought was interesting. Goth, of course, is Gaza City. That's Gaza. Um, Kalna is part of Iraq and, and these other places. So basically Iraq and, and Syria and um, Gaza. And we see Hezbollah and Hamas and these things going on now. So it's interesting how when you read it in Hebrew, not that it's necessary for salvation or anything, but it's, it's important to have a good study Bible, word-for-word -word study Bible, where you miss little things like that. And nothing specific out of that other than the Lord will completely destroy that group and no one will even mourn for them. They, will, they and their children will be completely gone. Uh, at the end of one of the passages it says. so. It's just interesting to, to see all these things and how this immense hatred for Israel comes up out of nowhere and you know attacks people. I had a friend um, uh, that was in the southern Russia and was part of the Orthodox Russian Church. 
not really a Christian, but just kind of part of it. And one day he realized that all of a sudden people in the church and outside the church uh, hated the Jews. And he didn't like them much either. He didn't think much about it. But then he thought, well, I don't like the guy. I don't want to do business with the guy, but I don't want to like take his kids and cut them up into pieces. So he started thinking about this and thinking, this is completely irrational. Where, where is this really weird hatred coming from? And that made him go to the scriptures, and he ended up becoming a Bible-believing Christian and immigrated to the States. So it's just interesting how some people wake up with this stuff going, you know, that's not right. Something else is going on here. And there's just many, many things we could talk about in that area, but uh, the scriptures are really fantastic. Uh, yeah, definitely. That, <laughs> that's so cool. I I, um, I wasn't aware of that. That's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, and I wish I could remember what it was in in one of my studies. Um, I want to say it was in Zechariah, but I might be wrong. Um, that the Hebrew word, um, I think it, it was actually Allah. It turned up and it meant like confusion or destruction or destroy some something something bad. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of interesting. It, it had nothing to do with what I was studying at the time. It it just turned up, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll make a note of that. Maybe I'll look into it later. And I just I haven't looked into it anymore, but uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's so cool how how stuff like that pops up, and uh, I I definitely agree that having a good study Bible to be able to get into the original languages is is uh, is important. There's a lot of study Bibles out there, though. Would you be able to recommend one that that uh, that's good? <laughs> Um, there's a probably a King James and a New King James Study Bible, just for the fact that those two translations have uh, the full text. Uh, I'm not going to say that one's better than the other, but a lot of the text are, are missing places. For instance, in the, if you go with one that's based on the Septuagint, in that Isaiah passage we talked about, it doesn't say the second time. That part's cut out, and that would I would not have I would have missed that whole thing about Islam and everything else had I not seen that second time in there. So it's important to get a good word-for-word -word study Bible, things that aren't cut out, that kind of a thing. I don't have any particular one. Uh, Thompson Chain is good. Uh, there's a, a King James Study Bible, a New King James Study Bible, and then some others. Um, there's Green produced a really wonderful um, uh, interlinear, although if you use something like eSword, that's free. You can use on your computer, and it'll have almost all of that kind of stuff and very easy to go back and double check the wordings of those. Cool. Yeah, I I like the Thompson chain. I've used that. I've looked at Green's interline interlinear. Uh I like that one too. Um and yeah, the online sources are great. Uh Doug Hamp has a program that he that he um promotes and uh I th I think he might have helped develop so I'm not sure about that, but it's called The Word. I've just started using that and I I like that a lot and uh Bible Hub and uh um, was it Bible Gateway? I think is another another online one, but uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. So there's a lot of great resources out there for people who are interested in uh, studying these things. Um, so back to back to prophecy. What are some of the other prophecies that uh, were fulfilled after 1948? Um, let's see. There were several. One of them in in Micah uh, talked about uh, uh, eight wars between Israel and Syria. Uh, starting from when they would come back the second time to when the Messiah would come back the second time. And, of course, that passage also talks about the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, you know, and will be given up um, because of the, the rulership in Israel at the time. Um, and because of that, Israel would be destroyed. And so there, there's a lot of things like that. But specifically, there were passages talking about how uh, they would take Ashkelon and Ashdod, which uh, currently are the fifth and, I think, ninth largest cities in Israel. And so it's interesting how those were mentioned to be a desolation and then to be revived. Um, let's see, we talked about uh, uh, the Hebrew language being resolved. Um, the actual date of when Israel was supposed to come back into the land uh, was prophesied, and actually also the date of when they would take the Temple Mount was supposed to end up on our calendar. It was June 7, 1967. Uh, so it's amazing how some of these uh, would happen. Uh, there's a prophecy about when the Antichrist would rule. It would be sometime after uh, the time that Egypt no longer has kings. Uh, Egypt stopped having kings in 1953. Uh, so you can see that kind of a thing. 
Um, let's see here. Um, one of the prophecies was that the Israeli shekel uh, would come back into use. And so it's kind of neat when I go places and talk, I will, if I can remember, I'll bring my shekel with me and hold it up and say, this is a film of fulfillment right here of Bible prophecy I hold in my hand. It's just kind of neat to do that because you, it's tangible. Um, one of the things was interesting, I thought, was in Ezekiel 38, uh, it talks about how uh, Russia or Gog and Magog would come down upon Israel. One of the things that it talks about, not under control, but with willingly with Russia or with Magog, is uh, several places, uh, Persia being one, which is Iran, another which is Gomer. And you've probably, uh, the, the word for, uh, well, Gomer is the ancient land of Germany. Uh, German Jews are called Ashkenazic Jews, and that's one of Gomer's sons. Uh, so anyway, the, the language is there, but it, East and West Germany was split because of World War II. And I remember when I was in um, uh, American English class in high school, and we were talking about World War II, and I raised my hand and, and said, well, the Germans started World War I, they started World War II, what do you think the chances are they'll start World War III? And he said, oh, no, never happened. We part, we, the land is divided. There's a wall there. Never, ever happened. And I'm thinking, you don't know much about prophecy. <laughs> but uh, what was interesting is, is that Gomer and all its bands unite and voluntarily go with Russia when they attack Israel. Well, that's not possible until the 1980s when the Berlin Wall fell. And so now East and West Germany are back together, and soon Austria will come with them in some form or another, and the bands of Gomer would be back together. So we get to see those kind of things. So I was in high school, and I actually watched on TV the Berlin Wall fall, but like normal, I'm like, man, I didn't know it was a prophecy. Uh, so it's, it's nice to know about these things ahead of time so you can watch and see them. But there's prophecies about Israel restoring the cities, uh, bringing back the original names. Uh, there would be farmers in the land that are non-Jewish farmers, you know, Palestinians. Um, tourists would actually fly in and support Israel. It actually says they fly in like doves. And, wow. you know, people, people look at that kind of thing and think it's, you know, poetry or something. Not really. You can't go to any, you can't fly into any uh, country around Israel and then go from that country and drive into Israel. They don't allow it. Uh, they don't, so they don't uh, say it's real, that it doesn't exist. They don't have it on any of their maps, uh, which again is another prophecy. That mentions that five cities would stay desolate. Uh, scriptures talks about Akron, um, Gaza, or not Gaza, but Capernaum, and several others. And all of those cities have been pretty much reconstructed except for those five cities, which are still basically ruins and a tourist attraction. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, let's see here. Uh, one of the interesting things, back in 2004, uh, the Sanhedrin was reestablished. And I think that's a fulfillment of prophecy, or partially, because remember when Jesus said, talking to the Jews in Israel at the time of the tribulation, when you're in Israel, and you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, he says, run, don't go back to your home to get your belongings, just get out. If you go back home to get your belongings, you're not going to make it because an intense persecution is going to start. And he says, pray that it not be on the Sabbath uh, or on in the winter time, you know, or this kind of thing. Well, why pray it's not on a Sabbath? Because it doesn't make any difference. I can just hop in a taxi and get out of town. Well, if the old laws are put back, you wouldn't be able to hop in a taxi on the Sabbath day and get out of town. So that tells me the laws will come back, and so I'm waiting to see the Sanhedrin. And in 2004, the Sanhedrin was reestablished um, under the, the auspices of the way Maimonides had disbanded and said that it would have to be put back. So they disbanded in the 400s, uh, reestablished in 2004. And at first they were kind of the laughing stock of everybody, 70 old guys that think they can tell people what to do. And everybody just kind of made fun of them. But very quickly, an awful lot of uh, Jews and non-Jews started paying strict attention to them because of what they really are. I mean, uh, and now they're not really a power in Israel, but they are respected. Uh, so it's gaining, and it's kind of interesting to see that beginning to, to happen. There's a prophecy that talks about Gaza being forsaken, you know, and we saw that happen back in 2005 and uh, the problems that happened along with it.
Uh, Iran and Russia and Turkey are supposed to form this military alignment, alliance along with uh, Germany. Uh, so some of those things have happened. And so it's just interesting just to see some of those. But there's a whole lot of other things that are, you know, in the works or partially fulfilled. But uh, just even a few of those, I mean, again, the United States can't make all that happen. Uh, things are, are gaining ground as we talk about. One interesting thing happened recently. Uh, for the first time in about 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed, uh, this Passover, uh, in, um, which was actually last week, um, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem uh, did a practice Passover, not on the Temple Mount, but under the Temple Mount, and then one in, in the Golan Heights, where they actually went through the entire ritual with proper koans and did a Passover sacrifice, roasted the, the, the lamb and ate it, and did the whole thing. So that's the first time in 2,000 years. So things are beginning to happen. They used to talk about how uh, about 30% of the Israelis wanted to rebuild a temple, maybe as a museum, and start studying Torah and stuff like that. And now the stats show about 60%. And there's a lot of people saying, we want our temple back. The Knesset the other day, one particular Knesset member went to the Temple Mount couldn't pray because of the other stuff, went to the Knesset, said, this is ridiculous. That's ours, not anybody else's. We need to pass a law saying we have sovereignty. Christians, Jews, and Muslims, anybody that wants to pray should be able to go pray, and this is absolutely ridiculous. And so they did that, and, and other things are going on there, but they said that it used to be one or two, maybe three old guys with a lamb would try to go up to the Temple Mount every year you know, sometime during the year and sacrifice, the police would always stop them. Now it's like one or two every month or every week somebody's trying to do something like that. So you can just see the, the people in general are saying, this is our land, it's our heritage. And of course, one of the prophecies is that they will rebuild the temple. And so that's not anytime soon necessarily, but it's coming. Wow. <laughs> I, you know, I, one thing that I... um absolutely love about the study of prophecy is just the many layers it, it goes down. You know, we can look at, like what you said about um, Jesus saying, you know, don't even turn back to get your coat, just get, you know, get out of town. Uh, at first glance, I never would have thought that you can find the <laughs> the Sanhedrin being revived in there, but with with a little bit of, you know, critical thinking, it would have to be. And that, that's what I love about prophecy is all the... Uh, Prophecies that are there that aren't necessarily spelled right out, but that you know develop later over time, and a lot of those we don't see until after, you know, a after the fact. Some of them we can we can look for, but I I think that is uh that is so cool. Um, and speaking of uh, you 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 mentioned it. Speaking of uh past and future uh, prophecies, can you tell us about uh Micah five and the seven shepherds? It's something I I've always I've always found interesting since I've heard about it. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, I, I have a video on my website and a, a handout, PDF handout that you can have for free uh, and print those out. But basically, what it is, it, Micah 5 is an amazing prophecy. It starts out talking about there will be a baby born in Bethlehem, you know, and he will establish this kingdom that will last to the, to the ends of the earth. And uh, that part of the passage is actually quoted in Matthew chapter 2. And Matthew tells us this is referring to Jesus. This is a prophecy that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And uh, he again, he doesn't finish the prophecy because that the first two verses say that this baby born in Bethlehem is from old, from everlasting, which is from eternity. And it's interesting if you if you look at the Greek instead of the Hebrew, from our eternity actually, or everlasting is arche. And when you go into the, the Greek of First John, you see John's constantly talking about, we knew that which was from the beginning, and he who, which is from the beginning, we our hands have touched and handled, and we have eyewitnessed him who was from the beginning. And he's quoting the Micah 5 passage over and over and over. The baby born in Bethlehem, he who is eternal from the beginning. But it goes on and it talks about how he's the shepherd of Israel and the rulers of Israel smite him on the cheek, which again, that part was fulfilled in Matthew 28, uh, right before the crucifixion. And it goes on and says that somehow he'll establish a kingdom to all the earth. you know. But because of his being handed over to the um, non-Jewish people in, in the area uh, to, be, to be destroyed, because of that, 
the Lord would hand Jerusalem over to those same people to be destroyed. And so you see in the prophecy, the baby born, the death of the Messiah, the seven, this destruction of uh, the Temple Mount in Israel in 70 AD, the dissolution of Israel as a state, it would be dissolved until such a time as it is reborn. And so you see in the prophecy, uh, two th or 132 AD, when Israel was no more, and then all the way up through 1948 when they come back. So sometime after 1948, the prophecy continues. And it says that, talking about this, this baby born, it talks about how Israel, back in the land now, will raise up seven shepherds and eight principled men who will uh, fight against uh, the Assyrian uh, or Syria. And the last one, of course, is going to be that baby born in Bethlehem that establishes a kingdom. And so when you look real careful, what we're talking about is eight wars between Israel in Syria, in which they take Syrian land. There could be skirmishes. So we're focusing on the area of the Golan Heights. So anytime Israel has some sort of a skirmish, a war, whatever you want to call it, but they actually take land that currently belongs to Syria, and now it's Israeli territory, that's fulfilled one of the prophecies. And so, so far we've had four of these wars between Israel and Syria. It starts with uh, 1948 and ends with the coming of the Messiah. And uh, it has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with the rapture. All four of them could be next year. It could be in the tribulation period. Who knows? But we're just halfway there. And there's a lot of other pro prophecies that kind of go along with that. But what's interesting about it is people have looked at that prophecy a lot and thought, well, why are, why are there eight principled men and seven shepherds? And when you look very careful at this, uh, the principled men would be the one ruling. So that would be the prime minister. The shepherd uh, puts, leads people to put people at the edge of the sword. So we would call it a defense minister or a general. And what's interesting is when you look at the first four wars uh, under Menachem Begin and um, I, I forget the others, but again, there's a, there's a handout you can get for each one. But we had four separate prime ministers and under the uh, rulership of the, prime, the second and the third shepherd or prime minister, principal ruler, was uh, Moshe Dayan, and he actually took the, temp, the uh, Golan Heights twice. And I just thought that was amazing. So now that it's halfway fulfilled, you can see why there's not eight prime ministers and eight generals or defense ministers, but there's eight and seven, because one of them fought the war twice. And so, again, it's the, those little things in Scripture. We look at those and think, I wonder what that means. But it's, it means exactly what it says. One little word like that sometimes, again, can make a difference of you seeing the prophecy or missing it. And that's why we need a good study Bible. Uh, but the prophecies are amazing. And then, of course, it ends up by saying the, the baby, you know, will create a kingdom and the kingdom will extend from one end of earth to the other and be eternal. And, of course, that's talking about the millennial reign. And then it goes in and talks about, you know, other parts of the prophecy. But it's one that's neglected, and it's amazing to see that many things happening in our time period. And that's just one of or a set of prophecies that have been halfway fulfilled and will be fulfilled in the next few years. There's actually other prophecies that talk about uh, one or two of those wars that the next shepherd war is coming up. And uh, prophecies that even tell us when the war is over, uh, the new borders of Israel. Right now you know where the border of Israel is, and you know during the millennial reign, it's all the way up to, I think, Hamath or somewhere up and halfway up through Syria. Uh, but after this next war, uh, the border is going to be, of Israel is going to be at Zarephath, where Elijah was. Uh, it's currently called Seraphon, Lebanon, and it's between Tyre and Sidon. So the new border will be up there, and it's prophesied, it's specific. The tribe of Benjamin is found and comes back and colonizes it. About the same time, they'll colonize the Negev, uh, which until recently has not been possible because there's not enough water. And the Israelis two years ago invented a new type of water filtration system, which allows you to pull water out of the air and just all sorts of amazing things. And they're giving the technology away to anybody in a desert area that needs it because it's actually very, very cheap to make, which is amazing. So again, there, there have been plans even back as far as Ariel Sharon when he was ruling. He said something about if everything works the way that they think it might, he might be able to colonize the Negev by 2025. And so it's like we're at 2014 now and they have water systems. So you know, it's, it's getting there. There's all these things that are happening one after the other.
again, the prophecies are amazing for us to just watch and see. Yeah, we definitely live in exciting times. Um, you know, I, I think it's funny, too, because the way that, you know, when I was brought up, uh, we didn't tackle too much prophecy, maybe a little bit here and there. Um, <clears throat> I remember, uh, I don't think it was through my church, but it was uh, through it, it was through something like that, um, where I got the the more uh, I, maybe traditional <laughs> view of the, the prophecy of the Assyrian, that uh, in in that these eight or uh, the, the shepherds and the principled men would all be at one time, and the Assyrian is just talking about the Antichrist, and it's all one one big thing. And you know, I, I thought that for a long time until I uh, probably until I heard you speak at uh, the the Branson 2012, um, and uh, that, I think that was the first time that I heard your explanation of Micah 5, and it makes a lot more sense because there's a lot that happens in there. You know, I think I think it's too much to. Uh, be just one thing, and when it talks about the, you know, the Assyrian, uh, uh, looking at it as uh, the the Assyrian people over the course of these uh, different wars, from uh, what 1948 or so, that, that makes a lot more sense, and uh, that's <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, some something else that's been uh, been debated over the past few years are the timing of the Gog Magog war and the war described in uh, Psalm 83. Do you think either of these wars have passed or are still future, or wh which do you believe will occur first with uh, with those? Well, in, in my book, Ancient Prophecies Revealed, I actually mentioned the Psalm 83 war uh, as back in I have to look. It's one of the Lebanese wars, um, and I think it was a partial fulfillment then. Uh, again, what you have to look at is the, the the nation. And again, you have to be very specific. If something's there, it's there for a reason. And if it's not there, it's not there for a reason. And so you look specifically as who is attacking Israel. And more importantly, out of those people around that would love to attack that aren't, why? You know, put them in a list and try to figure it out. Uh, I think that's probably upcoming again because even though the rabbi said that this is probably the, at the time the war was going on, probably the fulfillment of Psalm 83, uh, it didn't quite finish. I mean, as far as the way the language is, the nations are still there and still very capable of uh, attacking Israel again. And it, Psalm 83 makes it sound like when this is done, it's done. And so, but I'm looking at Psalm 83 to be another war coming up. Um, I'm looking for the Gog Magog invasion to probably be a precursor to the tribulation period. So I'm thinking they're not the same war. Uh, again, I, they're almost probably not the same war because the when you look at the sides and the different people, different gr groups or nations on each side. So I look at that way, but then plus, of course, we have these shepherds' wars coming up, and the war somewhere along the line they have a war and they take southern Lebanon permanently. And they take uh, the rest or another part of Golan and Gilead, which is right now the all of that is in the tip of Jordan. You know, and the West Bank seems to become a independent state because it talks about in that area between the seas and the Holy Temple in that area will be the headquarters of the Antichrist during the tribulation period. So um, something like that's going on. It also says that the Israelis will control the sea from um, the the tip of Egypt all the way to um, Seraphon, you know, in between Tyre and Sidon after this war. So that, to me, means no more Gaza Strip uh, as far as an independent state. Uh, maybe they all move to the other, but there's some interesting developments going on with that now because the Palestinians, well, anytime you have a dictator who is fine doing whatever it is as long as he gets money, um, then that's fine, but when the money goes away, then who knows what. But you can kind of control the situation that way. When you get the dictators to be overthrown and Sharia law comes back in, you get people who want to kill you, no matter what the cost, even if they die trying. And in situations like that, that's completely unstable. You can't control it. And so it's very spooky to have that kind of thing happen. Uh, Palestinian Authority has always been a terrorist organization, unofficially, I guess, but uh, somewhat controllable, in, in, in it for the money. Hamas and Hezbollah is in it for the bloodshed. Uh, the Hamas this last week said they're going to basically disband and unite with Hamas, or Palestinian Authority disband and would unite with Hamas. So now we have a Hamas operatives on the Temple Mount uh, doing who knows what. Uh, this whole thing is getting ready to explode again. Israel has stopped uh, trading prisoners. 
uh, closed off uh, the the area, uh, stopped any negotiations because they're saying, look, you want to work with the terrorist organization or you want to make peace with us. It's one or the other, but not both. Uh, you can't live next door to a guy that says, at the right time, I'm going to kill him, and I don't care if I go to prison or not. I'm going to strangle him with my own hands if I have to. You can't just turn your back and live with a guy like that. It's not possible. So, that, uh, again, those are some amazing things that have happened. And I noticed this Hamas-Palestinian uh, thing is probably, you know, as long as the Palestinian organization was somewhat independent, there's a possibility of peace and everything continues for a while. And now that they've uh, completely went in with Hamas, that's almost like a major turning point, like a war would be brewing at that point. And I noticed that happens the same week as we had the first blood moon. So it's really interesting to see, again, things happening that quickly, if you're knowing what to look for. Yeah, there was something else I was going to I was gonna ask you about is, uh, you know, there have been a lot of talk about these uh, blood moods and every, everything. I was uh, curious to get your opinion on the, on the whole thing. Well, the scripture talks about how, uh, um, like in Genesis, it talks about how the Lord created the sun, moon, and the stars for a calendar for signs and for seasons. And the word for season is Moedim, which is the festivals. Uh, so you've got seven festivals in Leviticus. We all know about Passover and those things. Jesus died on Passover, resurrected on first fruits. The church was born on Pentecost. The second coming and the rapture and the, those things are, are commemorated in the Yom Kippur ceremony and, and the other things in the fall. And if you look at the rituals, they teach prophecy. So that's very, very important and possibly even the exact time or of the day of the year it would happen on. It, it has been fulfilled that way in the past as far as the, the timing of the Messiah's sacrifice. Um, so you've got those things, and then in addition to that, other things happen. But it talks about the sun, moon, and the stars are for the Moedim, the, the seasons, for a calendar in general, and also for signs. And a blood moon is, is not necessarily a, a super rare event. It may happen every 20, 30 years or so, just a one-time deal. But to have it happen four times, uh, four times in a row on festivals. So this year it's going to happen on Passover and uh, I believe Tabernacles and then the exact same thing the following year. And so that's extremely rare. And any time something happens on a festival date, we should be aware of. Uh, for instance, uh, You've probably heard of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. It's not mentioned in Scripture. It's not a festival that God set up. But you look at all the persecutions and things that started on the ninth of Av. Uh, the first and second temples were destroyed on the ninth of Av. Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple on the ninth of Av. Um, the Jews were kicked out of uh, England on the ninth of Av, and I believe Spain on the ninth of Av. It changes slightly. It's like Easter on our calendar. It's slightly different every year, so you have to look on a Jewish calendar. Uh, but all those things keep going. So when a war is brewing and the ninth of Av is next Wednesday, you should be nervous for next Wednesday. I mean, it's just a pattern that continues, and we should be looking for patterns. Not that we should look for omens or look to astrology. That's completely different. That's Satan's counterfeit to get us, if we are wanting to look, to look in the wrong direction. Uh, but the blood moons, it's pretty amazing. There's, an, I need to go back and look at them, but they've happened about 10 times, I think, in the last 2,000 years on major events like 70 AD, 1948, 1967. Again, uh, so it doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen, but something is going to happen. And I've already seen people saying, like, see, it came and went, nothing happened, it's a bunch of bull, you know, this kind of stuff. And, and they forget that these are markers that start a series of events. For instance, uh, a year and a half ago, I think it was 2011, uh, you may remember there was a, a ball of light that came down and hovered over the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. You know, and they, they'd speculated maybe that was an Israeli drone, maybe it was a UFO, you know, who knows what it was. But it hovered there, and it was it was obvious because if you look at the footage, uh, after about I don't know 30 seconds or so, the Muslim waf, the, the the Muslim guards on the Temple Mount noticed it, blamed the Israelis, said it's an Israeli drone or something, started taking pot shots at it, and it went out of there. And so it's obviously not a man-made or a man couldn't have been in it rather to take off that quickly. So that kind of came and went with nothing, and I'm thinking, no, to me, 
that's like an angel, demon, or whatever, somebody saying it starts here. And it's pointing, if you're coming from heaven, pointing down on the Dome of the Rock, saying this starts now. But nobody knew what happened or anything until six months later. Turns out that was the very same week that the Arab Spring started. And so it did actually mark the start of a major, when all the um, the somewhat controllable um, uh, dictators were taken out of the way and the Sharia law people start coming back. And if they all get that way, they'll form a new caliphate and it will be an extremely dangerous situation for Christians and Jews. Uh, everybody will start getting killed over there. And so it's amazing whether what exactly happens. It's interesting that something came down and said, this starts now. Now we have a blood moon, and of course the process, whatever the process is, has started, and it may take a couple of years or even longer before we really realize the whole ramifications of it. But I think it's interesting that in the first week we see the PA dissolve and welcome Hamas in on that side. That's never happened before. So it's, you know, and that's just like, you know, I want to make friends with you, but instead I'm going to make friends with the guy that hates you and he's a mass murderer and we're going to just like put him right next door to you and we're all going to be buddies and that's just not going to happen that's to me it's something major has to happen very quickly on that and of course you've got uh, Iran uh, with its nuclear program and they may or may not do anything specific there's actually some Dead Sea Scrolls that talk about Iran attacking Israel uh, and the Lord, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. Israel can't even do anything with it, but the Lord completely destroys them, uh, which is interesting, just like in the Gog Magog War and in other places in the Old Testament. Sometimes the Lord will say, y'all sit here and watch the show, and then the Lord causes confusion in the enemy, and one half of the enemy thinks the other half of the enemy is Israel, and they kill each other. And then usually, you know, the whole army is destroyed and Israel's told, now get up and go collect the loot and go home and praise God. I've taken care of it for you. And we see that happening over and over in the Old Testament, and we see it prophesied with Iran and several other things. And so, again, we don't want to put a whole lot of stock in any prophecy from a Dead Sea Scroll or an early church father, although there are a few and they seem to be somewhat reliable. Just know that the 66 books of our Bible are guaranteed, and we need to make sure we understand them word for word. Uh, but there are words of wisdom and knowledge given to people. And as, even if you think the gifts have ceased, they were back then in the first century. We know Agabus in the book of Acts. So if you have early church fathers that have visions that seem to be legitimate and are written down, they're worth looking at and, and looking at the whole scheme of the things as it's happening now. Wow, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's so interesting how... As time passes, <clears throat> the closer that we, you know, get to the end, I guess, <laughs> uh, how much more of these these supernatural things are popping up and and influencing things, and you know, we're seeing things like lights, and there, there's always uh, there's always some news broadcast talking about that, or or like in uh, Egyptian like Coptic churches and stuff, they'll see uh, <laughs> they'll see angels and you know they they think it's Mary and they worship it and that's you know that's not good. But uh, it's it's just still interesting how a lot of that stuff is kind of crossing over and um, what what we can gain from that. Uh, so, something else too, um, talking about things that we we should be watching out for. Uh, a bit a big warning that we're given in the Bible is about this uh, this whole apostasy thing that's that's supposed to uh, that's supposed to happen. Uh, what what do you believe the apost the apostasy of the church will be? Do you think we're in it now? What, what kinds of things should we be looking out for? Yeah, uh, I did. There's a section on the apostasy in the church in my prophecy book, Ancient Prophecies Revealed. Um, but what I did was to look at that. I kind of have an idea of things, but I went through the scriptures. Looked at all the places where Paul talked about this will happen in the end times and this is right and this is wrong and kind of made a list. And then I went into what the church fathers taught, which repeated what Paul said and also added other things. And I came up with a list of uh, the church fathers have about 105 points of this is the way the church should be. And in the end times, it's going to be like this. And these two don't go together. And so it's interesting to look at that. Uh, now that if you take the list and you look at it, there's about five things that haven't happened yet. Five. Wow. And it's, just, it's just amazing. But like one of the one of the prophecies um, that was given by one of the rabbis or one of the church fathers is that uh, 
uh, this homosexual thing would come up. And again, we're not talking about the nations per se, but it's always focused on the church or God's people. And it's amazing to me to see that I live in Kansas. Kansas law is against homosexual marriage. The federal law, Marriage Protection Act, is against homosexual marriage. The people ruling have chosen not to change the law, but to ignore it and try to push something else. And most of the people don't want it, but it's amazing to me that you look in the church and some of the larger churches are going for it. And we should be the ones standing for morality, whether it's whether they like it or not. But it's interesting that we're kind of the leader of, you know, that's just one point of one thing that's wrong. And I thought it was interesting. There was a rabbi that made a comment uh, that said that right before the flood, uh, there has always been homosexual activity uh, on an individual basis. But right before the flood was the only time in the history of the world that the nations gave homosexual marriage licenses. So the nations not only allowed it, but endorsed it. And that was right before the destruction. And the rabbis speculated that if that ever happens again, that would be the time of the end of our age. And we've only begun seeing that in the last five years, you know, here in the United States. And so it's, again, seeing it, it's really interesting how those things go. But uh, there's a lot of apostasy. I think one of, the, one of the main things is that we, and it says in the book of Revelation that the church, end time church, uh, will not repent of its sorcery. And I've always wondered, you know, as a kid, what is sorcery? If it's eating a McDonald's hamburger, I'm in trouble. You know, but honestly, what is it? I have no idea. I remember Mickey Mouse with the hat in the cartoon, but I don't know if that's really it or not. So I started doing research, and I've, I've written books on this too, but you go back and look at what the rabbis say is the sorcery of the Canaanites in the pre-flood world, and it's all still relatively well documented in a lot of ancient scrolls. And the whole concept of sorcery is to uh, do some sort of meditation where you'll, your mind is blanked out, like what we would probably call TM. Inside the church, it's called contemplative prayer. Any kind of thing where you get yourself in an altered state of consciousness by staring at a candle or an idol or something and see a vision, that would be considered sorcery. Uh, we have examples of Balaam, who was a prophet, and it was also a sorcerer um, at the time or back and forth. Uh, so things like that. And then, of course, people do mind-altering drugs to get an altered state of consciousness. So drugs play in with that well. But there's all sorts of things like that. The church becomes corrupt and not talking about the differences of doctrine per se, but all the major things uh, that the church fathers talked about, about how the church replacing Israel uh, is an error. Uh, even the, in the epistle of Barnabas, uh, which was Paul's companion, he wrote a, a small booklet on... Uh, basically a typological prophecy. And all through the book, he keeps coming back to uh, uh, the threefold witness. If you're a mature Christian, you should have a threefold witness. And that is that you should be able to lead someone to the Lord. And he used the Romans road, which I thought was interesting. And uh, you should be, you should know prophecy fulfilled in your lifetime to be able to use that to witness. And then number three, you need to guard against the concept of evolution because it will come into the church in the end times and be a major problem. And I always looked at evolution as being kind of stupid, but not, nothing major to argue about. And then I realized if you believe that we evolved, there was no special creation, there was no fall, there's no need for a Messiah. The whole story is right there. It either happened or it didn't. And your Christianity is based on that. So at that point, we need to, to pay attention to those things. So all these things kind of fade in to the church. And basically, we just need to go back to the scriptures and take the scriptures literally. Understand that if the guy says, I fell asleep and I saw a dream, then that's going to be completely symbolic. It's a dream or a vision. But if it doesn't tell you, this is what I saw in my dream, my vision, my whatever, uh, then take it as literal. And, and you know, obviously, there's no seven-headed red dragons walking around. But uh, when it says these things are wrong, they're wrong. And you don't say, well, maybe that was back then. Well, you'd have to prove that. You know, you don't just say, well, I don't think I want to do that anymore. That's rebellion, and that's unacceptable f for the Lord. So there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I just thought it was interesting. The Church Fathers kind of made out a list of about 100 points, and we're about 95% there. Wow, that's, that's bad. You said there were, only, there were only five left? Yeah, I believe so. I'd have to go back and check my notes, but it's, it's in there. But, yeah, homosexual marriage thing was is one of them that... Back at the time when I was writing it, we didn't have anything like that in the United States. At least I wasn't aware of it anyway. 
um, and and several things like that, the sorcery thing and, and several other things. But it's just amazing how all that goes. The church replacing Israel to say that the gift of cease. Major thing, one of the major thing was uh, to ignore prophecy. Uh, they begin to despise prophecies. And we see that today. I mean, it's not like people... You know, if you're in a church and you're not taught prophecy and you don't know anything about Micah 5 or anything else, you're missing out, but you didn't do anything wrong. You just never were taught. But when you get people that stand up and say, you know, prophecy, the Lord will take care of that. You don't need to pay any attention to it. Just focus on what I'm telling you to do. Well, that's how we understand things. Because if you know this is where we should be, this is where we're going to end up, and, and that's wrong, and this is how far it goes, you can look and see where we are now between point A and point B. And you know the direction we're headed, and so you know what to fight against and what to support. And it all goes back to basic scriptures, New Testament. Yeah, ab absolutely. It's definitely it's an important part of our uh, walk with Jesus. I mean, he spoke so much about prophecy and everything. It's, I, I mean, I think it's an error to ignore it. And that's so I'm so excited to do a show like this because I, I, I just love prophecy. And, you know, it, it is sad that it's, uh, it is being attacked in the church more and more. Is, um, I remember when I was growing up, it wasn't even that long ago, um, it was more kind of ignored. But now there's almost, uh, there's almost a hostility towards it in, in, Certain areas of the church, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate. Um, we we touched on some of them. Have there been any other uh, prophecies that have been fulfilled recently, say within the past couple of years or so? And what what do you think is next on the prophetic timeline? Nothing that I know of in the last couple of years, uh, other than when you're looking at the the setup for Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog War. Um, uh, of course, Russia and Iran have made a mutual defense pact. And then a few years later, probably just a couple of years ago, I think it was, that uh, a Turkey has made a pact with them as well. That in itself is not a prophecy, but again, if anybody's attacked, they all su are supposed to all come down together, and the prophecy says how they are all will be together. And so it's it's kind of amazing the setup of that. Again, I'm looking for the the um, one, one of the next shepherd wars, the the uh, Lebanese, another Lebanese war. Uh, Israel is supposed to take uh, southern Lebanon up to Sarathon and keep it permanently. And you can understand this. I mean, they've, they've done their best to fix a problem, give it back, fix the problem, give it back. And that's fine as long as Hezbollah has these little rockets. Now, they're very dangerous, but I mean, they don't have a guidance system worth anything. So when I send a rocket towards you and it hits all around you, and maybe if you don't move, one might hit you. That's somewhat tolerable. It's not really and shouldn't be because somebody's liable to get hurt. But it's somewhat tolerable. But when Hezbollah gets any kind of a guidance system where all the missiles start hitting their targets, you can't have that. At that point, it has to stop. The reason they took part of the Golan Heights is mainly because of the rockets raining down. We have to have this side of it all the way up to the top of the mountain range to make sure nobody fires rockets down or throws grenades, you know, that kind of a thing. So they're going to have to do the same thing with southern Lebanon at a certain point, unless Hezbollah, you know, repents. And, of course, according to history and according to prophecy, that's not going to happen. And so those things are going to happen in the near future. Uh, so, again, uh, some major stuff in Gaza uh, is going to take place. Uh, I think it's interesting how it said Gaza would be abandoned at a certain point, and then at a certain point after this next war, they control the entire coast. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens in that with Iran coming up. There's there's a lot of things that uh, could happen in the near future. It's amazing. We'll have to keep our eyes out for that. Um, with, with our talk of prophecy tonight, if, if you could wrap everything up into one thing that you would want the listeners and viewers to take away from this episode, what would that be? Uh, study the scriptures for yourself. Uh, make sure you understand... Um, I would probably say Romans to Jude as far as what the church should be doing, how it's supposed to do things. Don't argue with it. Just follow directions. It, you know, it's not that complicated. Uh, if it is kind of complicated, then nobody knows for sure, so don't argue about it. But just go along, follow those directions. That'll make us all 90% the same. Understand the prophecies are real. Focus on the prophecies out of the minor prophets and then a lot of the stuff from the major prophets. Uh, get to know Daniel very, very well, and then Isaiah and 
Zephaniah and some of the other prophecies. There's some amazing prophecies in there. There's prophecies that are word prophecies. You've got to flip the words around. It's a riddle. There's musical prophecies. Like in Habakkuk, you have to know music to get, be able to figure out what the, the points are. Uh, there's all sorts of, of riddles like that. And I'm just amazed at how many things that the Lord has in there. One day he's going to say, did you ever notice that one? Did you notice that one? Did you notice that one? And I'm going to say, uh, nope. There's so many things in there. But again, focus on what the church father said was to look at the prophecies, find the ones where Israel is going to come back the second time or from all nations. And when it says when this happens, one, two, three, four, five will start and know that those have either already happened in the last 50 years or will in the very near future. And then you can start focusing on these things and putting them together. And then just start telling people about them. And at first, you're going to be the nut on the street. That's always the way it happens. And as soon as they see something on TV, they're going to come back to you and say, how did you know? Are you psychic? And you're going to say, no, nope, I'm not, but I have a book, a very special book. Let me share it with you. And you're going to be able to witness to them. They're going to take it very, very seriously. And so it's very important for us, like Barnabas said, to know the prophecies and guard against things like that. And, uh, you know, for the, for the people going to college, make sure that they're rooted in the idea that there is God, that God's in control. I, I, th I think it's important that we expose our kids to everything. They need to know about Buddhism and Islam, and they need to know about Wicca and things like that and see what it's supposed to do. Look at our Bible and see what it does so that when they go to college and are exposed to this, it's going to be old hat to them. I want them to know all about drugs and how good it makes you feel, and then the next day how you are permanently destroyed. I want them to know all this. So when people are having fun, I didn't lie to them. But they also know that that's going to really mess you up. So it's important to know everything. So I would work on that. Again, the, the New Testament completely and the Old Testament prophecies, and um, go from there. Fantastic. And I couldn't agree more, um, especially what, what you said about um, how we should keep our kids informed of what's going on so they know how to guard against it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father myself, so I, I can uh, definitely identify with that. It's important. Um, <clears throat> do, you, do you have or can you recommend uh, books or other materials people can check out if they're interested in learning more about Bible prophecy? I, I think you mentioned one, Ancient uh, Prophecies Revealed. Mm -hmm. um, what 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 else what else do you have? <laughs> um, I've written that. I've written uh, commentaries on Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, some of them contain prophecies. Very interesting. Uh, also on uh, the ancient church fathers, they're teaching on doctrine, which also is, goes into prophecy. Um, if you're like me and you want to know what the apostles of the disciples taught, it's important. Anybody who was an eyewitness of Peter, Paul, Mary, James. Uh, that could tell you, well, I asked them, and this is how they explained it to me. And they're very straightforward. There's a lot of that information. Uh, they're all premillennial. It's, it's very straightforward and easy, so it's, it shouldn't be confusing to anybody. But the source material for that is a 10-volume is a work called the Antinocene Fathers. It's very dry. And it's going to take you a long time to go through. Uh, it'd be like if you didn't know anything about what I taught, but you listened to every sermon that I've ever preached over the last 20 years. You could pull them all apart and figure out what I believe on the rapture and this and that and the other thing and pretty much figure out what makes kin tick if you did that. Um, you could do that or I, I, would, if you, I would encourage you to do that if you really, really want to dig into stuff and take a lot of time with it. But uh, Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History is a summary of that. Um, he wrote uh, Church History in 325 AD. Uh, so those would be probably the, the two main sources. A lot of the books that I've written have tried to just bring out all those points and show you the references so you can get my books, read them, and then go double-check them if you want to. Um, the books on prophecy, I've written one on the rapture, one on prophecies in general, uh, the 500 in chronological order, uh, the church fathers, um, Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Book of Enoch, um, things like that contain prophecy, help you understand it. The old history texts, like uh, the book of Jasher mentioned in, in the Bible, uh, doesn't have any prophecy in it at all, but it'll tell you the old words for things. So if you're not sure who Tarshish is, who uh, Persia is, who Gog or Magog is, I still hear people saying, well, I think Gog and Magog is probably Turkey or somewhere else and not Russia. And it's like, no, no, no. The old text, like Jasher, mentions the first six kings of Scythia and how they are Gog and Magog. 
and tells you exactly where they're at and who they are. Uh, Javan, you know, all the old names for Greece and all the other places, so you know when the prophecies are in Scripture, you know exactly who you're talking about. That helps a lot, too. So those are just good resources. Um, and then get together with people that study study prophecy like you and I and then a lot of other people. Ask questions and, and just learn. Good deal. If people want to uh, find out more about you, your ministry, or order your books, uh, where can they go? Uh, Biblefacts.org. Uh, you can also just uh, uh, look on Amazon. I sell all my stuff through Amazon. Uh, you can go to either source on that. I've got 21 books out currently on various subjects. Uh, on BibleFacts.org, we have a lot of uh, free videos, uh, some PDF handouts you can print out and use uh, for studies and for churches and stuff. You can also contact me uh, with questions or comments. Good deal. Well, okay, I think we're all out of time, but I want to thank you so much for uh, coming back on the show and sharing with us your insights and research. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely, anytime. We'll have to do this again. Uh, again, that was uh, Dr. Ken Johnson talking with us about Bible prophecy. I highly recommend checking out his books. Uh, they're very fairly priced considering the wealth of information that, uh, that they contain. Um, he also has a few things floating around on YouTube and, uh, and his website as well that would be worth, worth checking out. <laughs> um, I also want to take this opportunity to remind you about the new resource that's been made available. Uh, I'm sure our regular listeners and viewers will remember a few weeks back our uh, interview with S. Douglas Woodward about his book, Lying Wonders of the Red Planet. Uh, the interview that Doug and I did actually was around four hours long, and only a portion of that interview uh, made it to air. The last hour or so, which really contained a lot of the hard-hitting information, um, never made it to air due to time constraints. So Doug and I have decided to release an MP3 disc of the full extended interview along with several other resources, including free e-books, uh, rarely seen pictures of Mars, and, and much more. So for more information on that, you can check out my website at uh, ministry.com as well as Doug Woodward's website, um, faithhappens.com. It's faith-happens. There's a dash in between faith and happens.com. Uh, and I'm also told, told it will be available on Prophecy in the News. Um, I believe it will be paired with Doug's book, possibly by the time this episode airs. So uh, keep checking my website, Doug's website, uh, and the Prophecy in the News website for more information on that. I'll keep my website updated, and I'm, uh, I'm sure Doug will keep his as well. All right, well, all that being said, we are all out of time, so I want to thank you for watching and listening. Uh, this is The Sharpening. I am your host, Josh Beck, and as always, take care and God bless.